right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. Uh, this is uh, part one of the digestion unit. We're talking about structure and function, and basically the pathway that food travels uh, in the digestive system. So here's just a quick little overview of our digestive pathway and all the different components of the digestive system. And then there's also a couple that we call uh, accessory organs that we'll be touching on a little bit later. Okay, so let's get started with what's happening uh, in terms of our main idea. Our main idea, the whole reason why we digest food is so we can get uh, nutrients from our food, such as starch, proteins, and lipids, which will end up breaking them down into their monomers, which is going to be glucose or other monomer uh, of carbohydrate, uh, amino acids, and then we have our fatty acids and our glycerol. Okay. So you can pause that if you need to. So let's talk about the mouth first. So there's a couple types of digestion that can happen here. The first thing that we're going to look at is physical digestion. This is There's no enzymes involved here. So this is just the breakdown, the grinding of the food due to our teeth, and it breaks it down into uh, smaller pieces for larger uh, surface area. So it's going to help facilitate that chemical digestion. The next thing is chemical digestion. This is where enzymes are used. The enzyme that we have in our mouth is called salivary amylase. And this breaks down starch into maltose. And we'll look at the enzymes a little bit deeper on our next video. So this is the first time anything gets broken down, and it's carbohydrates. So there's no lipid breakdown. There's no protein breakdown in the mouth. Okay, So you can write that down. So the pharynx and the esophagus, so what happens is our tongue pushes what we call our food, we call it our bolus, that's just the moistened uh, food, partially digested starch, to the back of our throat uh, to make sure that it doesn't go down our windpipe, our trachea, the epiglottis, which is this, this little flap, uh, if we have a little picture here, so this little flap is going to make sure that it's covered up, uh, make sure that no food goes down into our lungs. And then we have an esophageal, or we also call it the cardiac, because it's close to our heart, uh, sphincter. It covers the stomach. So the esophageal sphincter would basically be just right here at the end of our esophagus before it enters our stomach. Okay. So basically what this is, is this is two parts. So it's the opening to our esophagus and our trachea. Okay, so you can pause that. And this is just an example of uh, peristalsis. And this is how our food actually travels down. It doesn't fall down due to gravity. These are muscular contractions that are actually pushing down that food, just like you would push up a freezy uh, in the summertime to get it up to your mouth. And the reason why we know this isn't just due to gravity is because if you're standing on your head, you can still swallow and it goes against gravity to get into your stomach. Okay, so our actual stomach, this is uh, muscular, it's a muscular organ, and it's lined with mucus to help protect us from the gastric juices. The gastric juices have a really low pH, uh, they're made up of enzymes, which we'll talk about what they are later, and hydrochloric acid, hydrochloric acid is not an enzyme, and it's usually in between 1 to 2.5 pH. What HCL does, its whole job is to activate an enzyme. The enzyme is called pepsinogen and the active state is called pepsin. And this is what starts to break down protein. Oh, I guess right here, starts to break down protein. Okay. Once we have this food bit broken down, so now it's kind of partially digested carbohydrate, partially di digested protein, and non-digested fats, we call it chyme. And it's very acidic because of the HCL. So it flows through a sphincter. And again, the sphincter is just these muscu muscles uh, circular muscles that contract to make sure that nothing gets in or out. When we're ready for the food to go through into the small intestine, it exits through the pyloric sphincter, which is right here. So your cardiac sphincter was here, and your pyloric sphincter is here entering the small intestine. Okay, so you can write that down. The next thing is the small intestine. This is the, this is the big deal guy. This is where all the things are happening. So this is where carbohydrates, proteins, and lipids are all completely digested. Uh, then they're absorbed as monomers. So we talked about the carbs, the glucose, we talked about the amino acids, glycerol and fatty acids. They get absorbed uh, into the bloodstream uh, once they've been broken down. 
Well, the problem too is that the chyme that came in was very acidic. So the pancrea pancreas secretes juice, which neutralizes the pH, the small intestine. We want it to be around eight, eight and a half. Okay, so it neutralizes the acidic chyme. And then we have these thing called villi, or singular is villus, and these are these finger-like projections. If you looked under a microscope at the small intestine, it would look more like this. Maximum surf area, surface area for maximum absorption. So the amino acids, glycerol, and fatty acids, and glucose are all getting absorbed into these microvilli uh, into our bloodstream. But glycerol and fatty acids aren't necessarily absorbed into your blood right away. They go into the lymphatic system. And we'll talk about what the lymphatic system is later. Okay? So you have to write that down. Oh, one more thing. There's three parts of the small intestine. The duodenum, which is the beginning part. This is where the majority of the absorption takes place. The jejunum and the ileum. You'll really only hear us refer to the duodenum for the most part in this course. Okay, so the large intestine, what's the, what's the purpose? There is no uh, absorption of digested material here. But there is some absorption. This is where the majority absorption of water takes place. Okay. Also, we have E. coli bacteria that's in our gut, and what happens there is it secretes vitamin K that can be uh, reabsorbed back into our system. Okay. And then the last part of the large intestine we call the rectum, which is the last few centimeters, and this is where the feces is stored. And then finally, uh, it's excreted out the anal sphincter. And so that's the third sphincter we're talking about. So a couple other things that we're going to talk about. Uh, diarrhea and constipation. So in order for this to happen, all it is is this the regulation of our water in our system. So when people get diarrhea, it's, it's caused usually by the uh, rapid contraction of the smooth muscle of the small of the large intestine. So smooth muscle. And what that does, if it's irritated, it causes the, the dige undigested material in the water to pass through the large intestine more quickly than anticipated, and so that water can't be reabsorbed. So that's why there's more water excreted out, and that's diarrhea. Whereas constipation is a little bit different. We have fiber in our diet that likes to hold on to water. So if we don't have fiber, that water is not being held, and more of the water is going to be absorbed into our system, and so less water will be in our large intestine and in our rectum, and so that'll just cause it to dry out, and that's where it gets uh, painful and constipated. Okay. So just as a summary, just want to know the pathway uh, that the food will take, generally what the functions are of each organ, and then also the causes of diarrhea uh, versus constipation. Okay, so we're going to come in, we'll be discussing this in class next day, so have a wonderful night.